I'm here today because I believe two things about all of us in this room. One, I believe that in work and in life, each and every one of us is doing our best. And two, I believe that in work and in life, each and every one of us can do better. Now, I know that may sound like a contradiction, but I don't think it is, and uh, I'll explain why in this talk. Uh, I want to encourage you to embrace a growth mindset, uh, and I'll share with you a tool to do so, which is called the personal retrospective. And it will help you become more productive as an individual over time in a way that's in line with your values. So, who am I in more detail? I'm a software engineer, and I have been for the past 10 years. I've led engineering teams, and I've mentored engineers throughout my career. Uh, if I could characterize my career in one word, it would be variety. So I've worked mostly at small to medium startups, but I've also worked at large corporations and research institutions. Uh, I've worked in spaces like the Internet of Things, education tech, health tech, uh, user research, social gaming, kind of all over the place. Uh, I also volunteer with groups that teach code to women and other underrepresented groups in technology. And through all of this diverse experience, I noticed a common thread, which is that the people who, the engineers and uh, the engineering teams that are most consistently successful are the ones who care about people. So they care about the customer, they care about their coworkers, and they care about themselves as human beings. So these people are so successful, but unfortunately, it seems to be a rare trait in our industry. That people, that people working in our industry, especially engineers and other technical professionals, actually value the human beings involved. So for that reason, I started a company called Compassionate Coding. And our mission is to bring more compassion to the tech industry. This means compassion for your customers, compassion for your coworkers, and compassion for yourself, because that's where compassion really starts. And what do I mean by compassion? Because it can have a lot of meanings. A lot of people associate it with religion. I don't. Um, I think that compassion is basically an optimization problem. So we want to minimize suffering across the board, and that's what compassion is really all about. So that's the goal, is to reduce stress in yourself and your coworkers. It's to you know, not build bad user interfaces because you don't want your users to suffer, things like that. So to accomplish this, I lead workshops at tech companies on emotional intelligence directed at engineers and other technical professionals. So this includes topics like mentoring, empathy, communication skills, and related topics. So emotional intelligence, in case you're not familiar, it's a term popularized by a psychologist named Daniel Goldman. And it refers to the ability to understand and manage your emotions and the emotions of those around you. So examples include not losing your temper when things go poorly, being able to comfort somebody who's upset, uh, and being able to motivate yourself to take action. So Goldman and others have argued that emotional intelligence is a key leadership trait. So that brings us to today's topic. Uh, so two essential components of emotional intelligence are self-awareness and self-management. So self-awareness is the ability, like it sounds, is the ability to know yourself, know how you're feeling, know what's motivating you. And self-management is the ability to grow yourself over time, so to develop your skills, to improve. So the plan for today. First, we're going to talk a bit about the motivation behind the retrospective. We're going to talk about how to prepare for doing your first one. And then finally, we'll talk about how to actually implement it in detail. So we'll start with the motivation. So here's a quote from an American uh, psychologist and philosopher, William James, who lived around the turn of the 20th century. He said, the human individual lives usually far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts, which he habitually fails to use. He energizes below his maximum, and he behaves below his optimum. So I look at this, and I think that's a pretty bleak state of affairs. We're uh, energizing below our maximum, behaving below our optimum. Uh, I think we can do better. So uh, he's not the only one who has pointed this out. These uh, performance consultants, Larry and Hirsch Wilson, who also wrote a book called Play to Win, say, we are so busy being busy that we don't take the time to reflect on and ask the questions that can reshape our lives. So does this sound familiar? Rushing around, trying to keep up, so busy that we can't really step back and take a look at our lives and see what we can change? So this is a pretty common issue 
Uh, so many people are sleepwalking through life. They're going through the motions, getting to work on time, doing the bare minimum, taking out the rubbish, going to the grocery store, but ultimately living below their potential. So what might this look like for developers and other IT professionals? It includes uh, issues like if you're always putting out fires at work, I hope that metaphor applies to here as it does in the States, it doesn't mean actual fires, but uh, just you know, bad things that happen at work. Not growing your skills, feeling stressed, this is a big one. And uh, I pulled up a report from the Swedish government that estimates that 50 to 60% of work absences in the EU are due to work stress. It could also mean just staying in an unfulfilling job. Uh, we're not spending enough time on hobbies or with family. So I see a lot of people struggling with these issues and burnout and anxiety are huge issues in our industry. And if you think about it, that's a pretty distressing state of affairs. So I saw this and I wondered, can we do better? Uh, is there an alternative to this bleak state of affairs that I presented here? And I think there is, and I'm not the only one. So. Uh, this guy is a trainer and uh, an author, Steve McClatchy, and he says the best way to combat burnout and stress is to continuously seek improvement in some area of your life. So what if there were a system of continuous improvement that would help guide us towards our goals? What if there were a way to hold ourselves accountable as we work towards these goals? So I got to thinking, and when I heard continuous Improvement, it reminded me, of course, of something I do at work, which is the Agile retrospective. So just to take a little pulse on the audience, so who is familiar with Agile software development in general? Okay, great. I expected that, but I wanted to check. Um, most of you. So, uh, and who here is familiar with the Agile retrospective meeting? Okay, good number. And how many of you practice the Agile retrospective in a team setting on a regular basis? Okay, not, you know, a good amount, a good amount. Um, that's great. Not everyone. So uh, for the few people who did not uh, know about Agile, I'm just going to cover it briefly so you don't feel left out. So Agile development grew as a response to traditional styles of software development where the big design was done up front, uh, things like waterfall with rigid processes and one phase leading to the next. Um, so a bunch of guys, and they were all men, uh, got together and decided, what if we could do things differently? Um, they came up with the Agile Manifesto. And at the heart of the Agile Manifesto is self-organizing teams who embrace change. So one of the principles is, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. And this is the idea behind the Agile retrospective. So typically, teams hold these, as most of you know, at the end of an iteration or a sprint, depending on what you call it. You discuss what went well, what could have gone better, and then you decide to take action. It's related to the idea of Kaizen. It's also similar to a postmortem, except that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to come at the end of a project. So I looked at this and I wondered, what if we made a little tweak and changed it to read like this? At regular intervals, I reflect on how to become more effective, then tune and adjust my behavior accordingly. So this is the idea behind the personal retrospective. You'll take an honest look at your situation and decide how to improve in a way that's in line with your values. So I've discussed this idea with some people, and they said, well, what about performance reviews? Aren't those enough? And I don't think so. So while well, performance reviews can be great for gathering some feedback, and in fact, I'll talk later about how to use the material you gather from performance reviews in your retrospective, I think that, in general, they're problematic. So usually, the, the performance review focuses on the company's values rather than your values. Or it may focus on your supervisor's values, but the point is, and you may there may be some overlap between your values and the company's values, but it's not focused on what really matters to you so much as what matters to your company or your supervisor. Also, they're usually not frequent enough. So most performance reviews, some companies do them every year, even every quarter, is really just not enough. And the final thing is that they're too narrow in scope. So because you're having this conversation with your supervisor, you can't talk about this stuff in your personal life. So, for example, if you're tired at work and your performance is suffering, it may be because you're just not getting enough sleep at home. And that may be because of something, you know, some uh, emotional drama you're having with your family. And the thing is, you can't always discuss that with your supervisors. So, um, that's, that's another issue with this. So, I think, you know, go ahead, keep doing performance reviews, of course, sometimes you have to, 
but I think the responsibility really lies with you to take control and really lead your career in the direction that you want it to go. So I'm not the only one who thinks this. So here's a quote from Jim Rohn, who's an, who was an entrepreneur, and he said, if you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. And guess what they have planned for you? Not much. So uh, supervisors and mentors may provide support, but ultimately you're the one who needs to take the reins of your career and steer it in the direction that you want to go. So you'll notice that I've been talking about looking at both your personal and professional sides, and I realize that this is potentially a controversial issue. Um, but I think it's important because you are one whole human being. So the thing, you're the same person at home that you are at work. You might act differently, you might think differently in some ways, but ultimately you're the same person. So if you're suffering physical or mental or any other issues in one area, it's going to affect the others. So I think to make real change in your life, you must consider yourself in this light as a whole person. So I mentioned the idea of you might be tired at work and, uh, because you don't sleep at home, but it works in the other direction too. So if you're dealing with work stress, you may come home and then, you know, be rude to your spouse or your family, whatever. And so that's another issue. So one final bit of motivation. So I'm so passionate about this topic. Uh, and the reason is it's made a huge difference in my life. So that's why I go out and share it with clients. That's why I came from California to share it with you, uh, because it's really just made a huge difference in my life. So this is the first retrospective um, that I ever did. It's, uh, I did it for a whole year, that's why it's huge. And uh, you can't read the cards intentionally because some of them were very personal. Um, and here it is sorted. Uh, it's a little, like I said, it's a little bit larger than usual because I did it for a whole year. Here we're gonna talk about doing it uh, just you know, after, week by week. Um, and like I said, it led to some big changes in my life. So after doing this retrospective, I went vegan, changed my whole like eating lifestyle. I ran my first marathon. And I started my own mission-driven company that I mentioned, Compassionate Coding. So I think it's a powerful tool. I'm confident that we can use it not just to beat stress and burnout, but ultimately to help us connect with our deeper values in order to reach our highest potential. So I hope that's sufficient motivation for you to keep paying attention. If not, I won't be insulted if you leave. So let's move on to the next step, which is preparation. So we'll talk about how to prepare to do your first retrospective. So in agile software development, we know that we have agile values that we can use to judge whether or not the team is effective uh, during the retrospective. So these include things like valuing individuals and interactions, working software, customer collaboration, responding to change. So in order to do your own retrospective, you're going to have to figure out what the equivalent is for you. Because if you're going to be determining your effectiveness, you have to be judging it against some set of values. So what do you value? Um, most people that I asked initially can't really name it. If you ask them, do you know your values? Well, oh, yeah, of course I know my values. If you actually ask them to list them out, you'd be surprised. People have trouble with this. So, and that's okay, because we have a strategy for dealing with that. So you might think, this session's supposed to be on productivity. Why are you talking about values? And for that, I offer this quote from Scott Belsky, who co-founded Behance, which is a network for creative professionals. He says, your productivity is really about how well you are able to make an impact on what matters most to you. So the key point there is you need to figure out what matters to you in order to really boost your productivity in the most meaningful way. So he's not the only one who thinks this way. These are some guys I mentioned earlier. They said, good plans, whether for individuals or organizations, begin from the inside out. So what are your values? Uh, and finally, just to drive the point home, Jim Lehrer and Tony Schwartz are executive and athletic trainers. Uh, they authored a book called The Power of Full Engagement. They say, connecting to a deep set of values fuels a uniquely high-octane source of energy for change. It also serves as a compass for navigating the storms that inevitably arise in our lives. So uh, I mentioned when I went vegan, and part of what made that so easy in some sense to do was that I did it because I connected with my deep values. So ethically, I couldn't deal with causing any more animal suffering. So for me, because I connected it to a deep value, dealing with all of the uh, logistics of like finding food and all of that came, like I, I could handle that. So in a similar way for you, when you decide 
that you want to achieve something. It helps if you can connect it to something that you really care about. Uh, because then when you, do have, when you do run into difficulties, you're less likely to falter because you care so much about getting it done that you'll find a way. Uh, so if you don't know your values, how do you figure them out? So the most straightforward way, you look at a big list and uh, you pick them out. And this works totally fine. Um, there are lists on the internet that you can go through and you can pick out the ones that you like. Uh, this is actually how I came to a set of core values for myself, is I just looked through a list. Um, but some people are overwhelmed by that or find it boring, so there are actually some other ways you can do it. One is to ask yourself, who do you admire? And uh, what are his or her admirable traits? So if you can think of a role model in your current life or people throughout history, what about them really like appeals to you? Uh, and then, what moments in your life are you most proud of? And what values did you display in those moments? So think about things that you've accomplished throughout your life. What, when were you happy? And like, when could you really stand behind what you've done? So that's another opportunity to look for your values. Finally, sometimes it helps to consider our mortality. So what would you do if you had a year left to live? Or a day? It's a little bit morbid, but it can be helpful to really look at, you know, to, to really find what you care about, think about, okay, if these are my final moments, like, what would I do? And that will kind of reveal to you sometimes, like, what, what really, really matters at the, the, the core of your being. So once you have a core set of values, um, then you can start thinking about your goals. So maybe you already have a set of goals. Maybe you already know what you want to accomplish. And if that's the case, great. Then once you have your list of values, you can just, you know, go through your values, go through your goals, make sure that they, they are in line. If you don't have specific goals in mind, then you kind of have two paths here. One is you could decide, okay, now that I have my values, I'm going to sit down with them and then look at my life and decide what I need to do in order to like, meet those values right now. Um, and that's, that's perfectly fine. If you feel inclined to do that and you have the time, you can do that. But I would argue that some people get overwhelmed by that prospect, trying to plan out their whole life right now. So I will comfort you by saying, once you have your values, I think that's enough to get started with the personal retrospective, and your goals will kind of fall out of that as you go. Okay, so another bit of preparation is scheduling. So I prefer to do the personal retrospective every week. So I do it on Friday afternoons. And um, I think this is effective because uh, I can look back at the week and I remember what happened because it's you know, fresh in my mind. Some people are tired on Friday afternoons and they prefer to do it on Monday. That's totally fine too. If you can remember what happened and you feel comfortable with that, you can do it. Um, if you're working on a sprint or iteration at work, you may want to time it to coincide with that just because if you're already kind of in the retrospective mood, especially for those of you who actually do retrospectives, it might help to do them at the same time. Um, you can also do it monthly. Uh, some people do this. And the issue with that is when you don't do it that often, you often will forget some of the details of what happened. So I recommend no less frequent than every two weeks, but again, it's up to you, of course. Some people do it every year. And uh, at this point, I'd just like to talk a little bit about New Year's resolutions. So every year, at the beginning of every year, we all get really motivated and we say, okay, this is the year I'm going to lose 20 pounds, I'm going to get a promotion, I'm going to learn Spanish, and you know, more on and on. Uh, and then what happens? We fail by you know, February or whenever. Uh, now why is this? I say it's because we're not holding ourselves regularly accountable. So while some people do it every year, and that's, that's fine, I would say that uh, if you can do it more often, you'll, you'll get more out of it. But again, doing something is better than nothing. So if you can only do it every year, Fine, but you know, do it consistently. Speaking of which, mark it in your calendar. So whatever you decide to do, when, however often you decide to do it, mark it in your calendar for two reasons. One, you're making a commitment to yourself that yes, I'm going to do this every week or every two weeks or whatever. Uh, and then two, it's to block out the time so your coworkers don't schedule meetings over it. I say that you only need 15 minutes to do this every week, which is not a lot. For the first one, you may want to schedule a bit more time just because you're just getting into the process and you kind of need to figure it out. Um, so maybe 30 minutes for the first one. Okay, so the supplies that you need, not very complicated. Uh, Post-it notes and a whiteboard. And the whiteboard is even optional. 
So if you don't have a whiteboard, wall is fine, or a window. I like the whiteboard because then you can write on it, of course. Um, but it's not, it's not a requirement. Uh, so the other aspect of this is figuring out where to do it. So you're going to be talking about work and personal life, so you can do it in either place. At work, it might be embarrassing to do it if you're going to discuss some personal stuff, so maybe you want to do it at home so that, you know, when you're writing stuff down, people don't read it and you get embarrassed. So it's up to you, though. Either one works. And uh, I say use post-it notes and a wall. But, you know, you may think that you would rather write down in a journal, uh, use pen and paper, or uh, even a digital project product. So you might want to write it in like Microsoft Word or, or whatever you use. Um, in fact, somebody, I was talking to somebody about my session and they said, oh, so is there a tool to use to do this? And I said, yeah, it's post-its and, and, and a wall. And he said, uh, you realize this is a digital conference, right? And I was like, yeah, I do. Um, so I, but I actually think that as technical professionals, we stand the most to benefit from taking a step back and, and reminding ourselves of the real world. And uh, so I think having these tangible objects, the post-it note, the wall, I think it can make a huge impact like, on your life to, to, to take that, that step back and really look at things from a distance uh, instead of being you know, in the computer all the time. So that's my thought on it. I also think that uh, having actual tangible objects is more fun. And if something's more fun, you're more likely to do it consistently. OK, so we're motivated, we're prepared. Now it's time to actually implement this. So the implementation itself has three steps. First, we'll gather data. Two, group and prioritize issues. And three, generate action items. So they all start with G, helpful to remember. Uh, so what are we looking for when we're gathering data? Well, just like in an Agile team retrospective, we're looking for what went well and what could have gone better. And, you know, while you're considering these questions, it's important to keep in mind your core values that you discovered in the preparation step. Because uh, if, you're, if you're trying to evaluate these according to somebody else's values, then it's not going to be you know, as beneficial to you. So when you're looking at these questions, really much, like, very much focus on your values. So you're getting the most out of this. And then what do you do when you discover one of each of these? Uh, write it on a post note so, or a sticky note. Uh, no need to pick a brand. Um, and then, so you might be wondering, so if you remember what happened over the week, then you can just write them down or, you know, uh, but maybe you've forgotten uh, some of the details and that's, that's okay. So uh, here are a few suggestions for how to refresh uh, your memory on what happened through the week. So one place to look is your calendar. So if you look over your calendar, you can look at the meetings and appointments you had over the past week or two weeks, however long you're doing this. And uh, consider which ones were you stressful and which ones were, did you walk out of and you were like, yeah, that was a great meeting. Um, I think it happens sometimes. Um, so that's, that's one place to look. Another, if you keep a journal or diary, which I highly recommend you do for many reasons, uh, I won't go into now, but um, it might be nice to review that because maybe you've written about things that you're frustrated about or whatever. Uh, the other place to look, so if you use an issue tracking system like JIRA, or Pivotal Tracker or Trello, that's a good place to look because then you can see, okay, what did I get done this week? Uh, what was I supposed to get done? And how do those match up? And similarly, you can look at your commit log uh, if, if you are a developer um, and uh, see, okay, what did, I, what did I get done? So you can you know, consider yourself kind of like a detective looking for clues because it's been long enough that you don't remember what happened. So another option is to talk to your coworkers. So, I mentioned the performance review, and that's, that's one place. Uh, also, if you have any mentors, you can talk to them, gather their input. And, uh, but I also think it's important to talk to your peers, because they're the ones that are likely spending the most time with you on a daily basis. So you can approach them and just ask, hey, you know, what do you think about how I did this? Or, or you can ask specific questions, or just ask in general if you have feedback. Um, just keep in mind that if you're going to do this, you need to have a little bit of a thick skin. And we'll talk about that in a bit, because um, if you ask for feedback, and uh, especially engineers, they're willing to give it to you. Um, so uh, one last point here, though, is to remember to whatever feedback you do get from these people, filter it through your core values, because everyone's operating from their own set of values, and some of those are in common with you, but some of them aren't. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, so once you start doing these retrospectives a lot, you may realize that it'd be helpful to have a notepad by your computer. And then whenever something annoying happens, you write it down. And whenever you, something wonderful happens, you write it down. And that way, you'll just have this nice list that you can think about during your retrospective. Um, I had a coworker who did this, and he was prone to losing his temper quite a bit. So every time he got angry, he would write it down. And then, you know, then he was like, like zen about it. So it can be helpful for stress relief, too, um, to write it down. So that's another option. So I mentioned that we're just going to talk about that we're going to gather what went well and what we can do better. So I want to delve deeper into each of those. So one is what went well. Now, you may be thinking, I have limited time, and I'm trying to figure out how to improve, so why should I waste any time thinking about what I did well? And there's a few reasons for this. So first of all, it helps to call out uh, patterns of success. So you might identify patterns of success by reviewing what went well. So you can repeat it, right? Kind of makes sense. So things like this, examples of what you write, might write down for these points are, I brought a healthy lunch to work three days this week, or I closed out all the tickets that I had planned to this week, or I spent time mentoring a junior engineer, which I encourage mentoring across the board. Um, but on a higher level, I think that recognizing what went well is a way of cultivating gratitude. And uh, gratitude has many benefits. So the Greater Good Science Center of the University of California, Berkeley, writes that gratitude boosts feelings of optimism, joy, pleasure, enthusiasm, and other positive emotions. So quite frankly, gratitude makes us happy. And when we're happy, we can uh, increase our energy and enthusiasm. And we're more likely to accomplish what we want to accomplish, because success leads to more success. Uh, so, um, finally, uh, recognizing what went well really helps cultivate resilience because we're also going to talk about what didn't go well, right? So it's kind of good armor to be like, well, I did some things well. So that's a good point here is that, uh, especially as engineers and other technical professionals, we're often focused on the negative side of things. So maybe we're fixing bugs. Maybe we're worried about security breaches or fixing a security breach, or whatever it is, we're trying to think about how could a system break, or you know, how, could, how do I need to like fix this? Uh, so taking this time to think, what is good in my life? I think can be a refreshing break for uh, the technically minded. So speaking of that, so the next step will be thinking about what could I improve? And uh, this can be a painful process. So you know, we all have egos, whether we want to admit it or not, and thinking about what went poorly can kind of hurt. So, uh, you know, for this stage, we're asking ourselves, where did I not meet my goals? Where did I falter in terms of my values? For example, do I claim to value kindness, but I lost my temper with a coworker? Did I intend to go to the gym three days a week, but I didn't go at all? Do I find a weak, did I find a weak spot in my JavaScript knowledge, or did I break the production system? Whatever may have happened. Um, and uh, so, you know, nobody really likes to think about this stuff, at least not at first. So there are a few things I'll, little comforts I'll give you to, to help you through this part. So one is a reminder of the prime directive. So this is from a book um, on retrospectives uh, by Norm Perth, and it says, so a lot of times teams will read this at the beginning of retrospectives, or at least it's kind of understood that this is the case for retrospectives. Regardless of what we discover, we must understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job he or she could. Given what was known at the time, his or her skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. So this is what I meant at the beginning of the session when I said we're all doing our best, but we can also do better. So we're doing our best given all of this. So you know we're all dealing with lots of things in our lives. And so at any given moment, we're doing the best given all of those conditions. So the way we get better is improving those conditions. So another little bit of comfort is the idea of self-compassion. So self-compassion is uh, the idea that you when, you, when speaking to yourself, which we all do, not in a crazy way, but inside of our heads, um, you, we often are hard on ourselves. So when we make a mistake, we beat ourselves up. We say, oh, you were terrible. Oh, you did this wrong. Oh, you did that wrong. And self-compassion urges us to say, why don't you treat yourself as you would your best friend? 
So if your friend broke the production system or didn't go to the gym enough this week, would you say, you idiot, why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? Probably not. I mean, you might, but then you're not very good friends. So I say that if you're going to be that nice to you know, your friends, like, why not be that nice to ourselves? Um, so I actually wrote a blog post on this recently. The link's here. Um, I'll put the slides up uh, on Twitter later, so, so you don't have to worry about it. But um, I wrote about self-compassion specifically related to coding, because I think a lot of times I've seen so many people call themselves idiots when they're dealing with a coding problem, and I don't think there's any need for that. So this also ties into the idea of emotion-free mistake-making. So the idea here is that we're all going to make mistakes. We're human, and that's what happens, uh, at least you know for now. And so when these happen, we can either get upset uh, you know, and give in to that, or we can take a step back and, and treat it as a learning opportunity. So this phrase, emotion-free mistake-making, comes from Angela Duckworth, who wrote this book called Grit. Uh, it's a really great book. Um, and so we're not going to beat ourselves up when we make mistakes, is basically the idea here. And this ties into the growth mindset. So was anyone here able to go to the lunch yesterday on the growth mindset? Show of hands. Wonderful. Okay, so, um, so you know about it. And for everybody else, um, the growth mindset is an idea from Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck. And she proposes that we all have two ways of viewing the world. One of those is the fixed mindset. So with that, you believe that you have a certain set of skills and abilities and that those aren't going to change. Uh, and the alternative is the growth mindset, which says, okay, I have these skills and abilities right now, but I'm capable of growing those over time by applying effort. So that's the idea behind the growth mindset. And uh, in, with Dweck's research, she found that people who believe in their ability to get better over time do, <laughs> surprisingly. And people who don't, may succeed at the beginning because they may have natural talents, but they'll eventually hit a plateau, and then they'll stop, they'll stop progressing. So for our personal retrospectives to be most successful, we really need to cultivate this growth mindset. So believe that, so instead of believing, I'm just not good at JavaScript, or I'm not a creative person, or I'm not good at maths, or whatever it may be, like push that out of your mind. Like get rid of those negative thoughts because that's not true. Any skill that, you, that you're thinking of, you can grow over time. You may not become the best at the best violinist or whatever, but you can get better at the violin by applying effort. So here's a quote from a book called The Optimistic Workplace, which I highly recommend, just the whole thing, but here's a quote about the growth mindset. A growth mindset will strengthen you when you face obstacles and enhance your excitement when you achieve your goals. So... Uh, that seems like reason enough for me to, to cultivate a growth mindset. But um, so while you're in this process of looking at what you could improve over time, because that's the stage we're in, uh, another thing that might help is to think about um, what you can get out of the process. So here's a quote from Ray Dalio. He is the founder of uh, Bridgewater Associates, which is a very successful investment firm. He wrote a book called Principles, and this is one of the ideas from that. More than anything else, what differentiates people who live up to their potential from those who don't is a willingness to look at themselves and others objectively. Kind of makes sense. And that's what we're doing with the personal retrospective is we're looking at ourselves objectively. Okay, like, what did I do that was successful? What did I do that was not successful? And how do I address that? So another thing he said, he had to put this equation, uh, pain plus reflection equals progress. And I really like this because pain is inevitable when we're doing this process of self-improvement. Because like I said, we all have egos. And when our egos are confronted with the fact that we're not perfect, it can be a painful process. So pain is going to happen. But what we can choose to do is be reflective and look to see what we can improve to, to, to make things better over time. So what we can change to improve over time. So, just a small point. Some people ask me, well, how many, how many things should I come up with each week? There's not a set number. My suggestion is to time box it. So, I mentioned that you can do this whole thing in about 15 minutes. So, maybe you dedicate five minutes to brainstorming uh, the issues or, you know, choose some other number. But I would say time box it and then write as many as you can during that time. Because it's okay to have a large number. Because what we're going to do is go through a filtering process next. So it's fine if you generate a ton. 
So speaking of that, the next step is to group and prioritize issues. So here's an example. Uh, these are uh, made up, but loosely based on things that have happened in my life. So we divide uh, the board into two sides, uh, one which is what went well, and the other what we could improve. I like to draw faces, but I don't want to do a sad face because I, you know, I think it's a learning opportunity, so I'm not sad about it, um, but that's just me. And then we'll put up our sticky notes and then group related items. So you'll see here, I grouped that I read two books and I finished a course online because they're both kind of related to growing my skills. Um, but on this side, I know my handwriting is atrocious, but one of them says skip two runs and one said that I dined out greater than three times, which is more than desired. And those are both related to health and wellness, but I didn't group them because they're different issues. So that's one caution here is to not group things too tightly. And this is true for team retrospectives too. Sometimes people group things and then they're just like, you know, oh, we're just bad at DevOps. And it's like, okay, well, you know, let's tease that apart because uh, it, it's going to be hard to address. Um, so that's that. And then the next step is to put a star on the ones that matter most to you that you really want to address this week. So if you only have a few, you can probably address all of them. But if you've generated a large number, then you're going to have to make some choices because there's only so much that we can change in a week, right? So I would focus on the top three because I think three is something that we can, we, can, we can manage. And then it's time for the most important step, perhaps, although all the steps have their value, which is uh, generating action items. So this, there's an art to this. So it seems pretty straightforward. It's like, okay, I figure out I see what my problems are, and then I just fix them, right? But if you've done team retrospectives, you know that it's, it's not always such a simple matter. So I like to think of it as debugging our life. So for each issue that you identify that's wrong with your life, I say address it with the same mindset that you use when you're debugging a problem or troubleshooting you know, a DevOps issue, whatever it may be. So these include things like investigating the issue. So look for some of the surrounding uh, events to whatever it is that's broken. Uh, so, you know, when, uh, so an example, I, uh, I was not getting, I felt like I wasn't getting enough sleep and I realized that like at night I was like, looking at my phone and it was keeping me up and so uh, my problem was not getting enough sleep, but the way I figured out what to do about it was kind of thinking a little bit further into it and like, oh yeah, because it's always, I'm spending too much time on my phone. So now I put my phone out of the bedroom and get much better sleep. Um, so that relates to this too, which is searching for the root cause. So you, you know when we're troubleshooting a bug, sometimes the symptom that we observe is related to some deeper issue that's actually causing it. So that's something that you can do with this process too, is look for the deeper issue and try to address that. Um, which will naturally happen as you, uh, as you approach this process on a continuous basis. Because if in one week, you fix, maybe you try to fix the symptom and it doesn't work, then in the next week, you know, you realize that was not a good approach, so you move on, try something else. So uh, again, here, in the same way that Agile is about continuous improvement over time and iteration, that's the same approach we're taking here. We want to iterate, so we do whatever small thing we can, and then we'll do, we'll do more next week. So then you make a small adjustment, and then you measure the results. So that's actually coffee. Um, which may indeed be the solution to your problem, but may not. Um, so some of the qualities of effective action items. One is there, so these are kind of from the SMART goals thing, which you may be familiar with, but uh, I think some of those are redundant, and so I'm just picking out the ones I like. So one is specific. So if your issue is, like I mentioned, um, I'm not getting enough sleep, you might say, I'm going to get more sleep this week. And, you know, that is an action item. But uh, I think a better one would be, I'm going to be in bed reading a book by 10 o'clock. And here, the idea is, if you make it more specific, it's just easier to know what to do, right? It's pretty straightforward. So related to that is the idea of being achievable. So let's say you feel weak in your Python knowledge. So you may say, I'm going to become a Python expert this week. And that is an ambitious goal, and maybe you can accomplish it, uh, but maybe not. So uh, another option would be, I'm going to complete the first week's lesson in Coursera's Intro to Python course. Now, this happens to be more specific, but I think more importantly in this case, it's achievable. So, while you probably can't become an expert, 
you can definitely complete the first lesson in an online course. Probably, I don't know, I believe in you. So, um, while you're doing uh, this action item generation process, you can write it on the whiteboard, that's totally fine, but also record it somewhere more permanent, uh, because, you know, what do you do with this list? Do you just kind of forget about it till next week? Like, no, you know, the whole point is you wanna think about it the whole week. So, I say write it down, tape it to your monitor, um, have it like near your computer, maybe put it in a digital document, that's fine, put it on a sticky note, whatever uh, you know, works for you, but definitely keep it somewhere visible throughout the week. And if there's anything specific that you wanna add to your calendar, like a meeting you wanna have, or somewhere you wanna go, or something you wanna do, put that on, put that, um, take the time to put that on your calendar at this point, so that, you, that you'll do it. Um, and you will also pull this list out at the next retrospective, because during the part where you're thinking about what could have gone better, looking at your list from last time to see how well you've met up with it, that's, that's a good way to get more of, the, more of the points that you need to improve. And uh, one thing I want to oh, clarify here is this says to-do list, but as I mentioned, sometimes, uh, like with my phone, not reading it while I'm sleeping, sometimes the most important change you can make to really uh, make an improvement into your life is to stop doing something. So uh, sometimes this will be the to-not-do list. So don't get hung up on like, having to do something. Sometimes simplifying your life is really, really the answer. And then repeat. So we do this every week or every two weeks, whatever you decide. And uh, accountability is built into the process. So because you're looking at this every week, you'll see how you're doing over time. But uh, you know, if you really want to evaluate the effectiveness of the process overall, here's what I recommend. So I mentioned that some people do a monthly or a yearly retrospective. And maybe still do those, but also do the weekly one. But for the monthly or yearly, make them a little longer. And then look back, you know, further in the past and think, so did I really, did, did doing this retrospective process really make a big change in you know, what I've accomplished over this period of time? So do like a longer retrospective at those like junctures. Uh, because you know, a retrospective is like any other tool. Uh, you try it, see if it's helping you, and if it is, keep using it. If it's not, stop using it. So this works really well for me, but maybe you know, your life is a little more hectic and you just don't like the idea of having to do this, or maybe you think it's silly, whatever. So, you know, it's up to you. I just, I find it useful, so I just want to put it out there as an option. So speaking of that, I am totally about people doing like what's right for them versus what other people tell them to do. So there are lots of variations in what I've said today, uh, to, to what I've said today. So in terms of when you do it, how long you do it, uh, where you do it, what supplies you use to do it. Uh, and as you know, if you do agile team retrospectives, there are tons of formats to do for this. So I mentioned just what went well and what we can improve. That's like the basic level, but there's many like um, start, stop, continue, uh, more of, less of, uh, I like and I wish, which is kind of fun to think about because you need to make wishes about what you want for your life. Um, so you know, those are some options. Like I said, you could do it in a journal if you want. Maybe that's better for you. It's totally up to you. There's no wrong way to do it because honestly, any form of self-reflection is better than none, and most people do none, so. So I know some of you will be disappointed if I don't show code, so here we go. This is how most people live their life. Uh, while not dead, they exist. Um, and ex that exist method would be things like, like I mentioned, like taking out the rubbish and going to the grocery store and going to work and you know being a dutiful employee, at least the minimum level, and uh, paying taxes and all of that. And, and that's a totally fine way to live and some people embrace this lifestyle. However, I present this alternative where you gather data, you group and prioritize issues, you generate action items, and you get better, most importantly. Um, so obviously, both of these approaches have the same end condition, which is uh, you die. Um, and uh, <laughs> can't change that, but uh, personally, I think this one is just a little more, this way of living is just a little more interesting, so that's why I do it. Now, I mentioned my talk to somebody yesterday, and he said, okay, but what if I do the retrospective, and the thing that needs to change is someone else? How do I make my boss change? Or how do I make my wife change? And I said, well, you cannot. So the thing is, we can only change, we, we, we should focus on what we can control, because there's only so much we can change and we don't have power over other people. We can try to convince them of things, we can make persuasive arguments, but ultimately, we cannot change them. So, but we do have a huge amount of control over ourselves, and both emotionally and you know, in, in terms of actions that we take. 
So the picture is because I think we're all steering a boat through life, right? And we can't control the, the wind, we can't control the sea, we can't control other boats, but we can adjust our course and continue. So I want to leave you with this quote, which is uh, from uh, 99U, which is a part of the uh, Behance network that I mentioned before. They have this collection of essays called Maximize Your Potential. And they write, it's easy to sleepwalk through life, to operate at the level of good enough. But if we want to truly excel in our careers, we must awaken to our own profound capacity for growth. So my hope is that you find the personal retrospective helps you tap into your deepest values. And in order to do exactly this, which is, you know, awaken your profound capacity for growth. So here's some of the references that I mentioned today. And again, I'm going to put these slides up online, so don't worry about capturing it, but, um, but there they are. Uh, they're all really inspiring books. Some of them I reference quotes from, and others just kind of informed my thinking on this whole topic. So with that, talk to the kit, and thank you, <laughs> Tech Dave. Here's my contact info. questions. I know uh, engineers are typically very skeptical, so bring it on. <laughs> Sorry for the breathing. This thing, like, it's hard to adjust because it's on, like, because I'm wearing a dress, and so that's why it's been kind of a process, but thank you for your patience. Do you have any sheet sheets? Sheet? Sheet. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> I'm not sure. A sheet sheet. Cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Oh, okay. Uh, so I am working on one. So if you if you um, give me your contact info or follow me on Twitter, I will tweet it out. Uh, you know the the worksheet. So cheat sheet type thing. You were gonna say? Uh, yeah. Uh, given your experience with uh, having retrospects and so on and so forth, kind of like in a fast speed top three ways to motivate your your team to do a retrospect because. That is personally what I find hard, is to make people understand why they need re their retrospective. Mm -hmm. Because if I say, okay, so it's Friday afternoon, it's an hour, now let's do retrospective. Yeah. They go, oh, yeah, so it means it's free for an hour, let's go have lunch. Uh, or let's go home, rather. Yeah. Uh, so what should I do? Yeah, so I think the most important thing, and one of the reasons teams fail on this, is not seeing any changes as a result of the retrospective. So, you know, I've seen this happen so many times where people have, like, the same problems, and they talk about the same problems every week, or, uh, you know, whatever they talk about just doesn't get fixed, and then people just kind of are disillusioned. So I think finding a specific thing that you can address from one retrospective can, can open up, like, a world of possibilities. And so I'd also recommend, there are a lot of different formats, and sometimes changing the format can spice things up. Uh, it sounds like kind of cheesy, but I think it's true. So I've done this with teams where we were doing the same, it was, it was a creative format, it was, um, it was like a race car one, and then you have like a, a, a thing behind you that's dragging you. And um, the, that we were doing that, people were so bored with it. So we switched it up, and so there's ones like a sail, there actually is a sailboat one, you know, where you can talk about, like the sea monsters that are in your way and the rocks that your ship's about to like hit. And so, I don't know, sometimes it can be putting a little fun into it, just like in anything else, can like get people interested. But I think most importantly, showing that you can actually change something as a result of the retrospective. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? It's also something you must know. Uh, engineers are very skeptical. Swedish people never ever ask any questions. Oh, okay. I did not know that. We will, we will talk to you happily afterwards, but we oh, okay. never ask any questions. Well, you broke the mold there, yeah. so, yeah, you know, no, that's, pioneer. That's, that's, that's my, my role in life. Okay, well, then let's, let's uh, let that happen. So, thank you all. <laughs>